Happy Halloween, kids! It's your old friend Big Hoss McGraw to give you some important safety tips when you go out trick-or-treating this year. Tip number one, always go trick-or-treating with a buddy. It's a lot more fun that way, it's safer, and hey, you'll always have an alibi. Tip number two, if your candy looks suspicious, don't eat it. It could be laced with some kind of gimmick, some kind of drugs, God knows what. If there's one thing people who buy drugs like to do, it's buy themselves even more drugs to put in candy to make strangers sick. I mean, that's just a natural progression. Anyway, if you happen to find some candy with some gimmick in it, if you follow my meaning, give it to me. Just me. And tip number three, the only thing more important than keeping your candy haul safe is your personal information when you go online. That's why you gotta use Surfshark VPN. We tell you all the time here on this channel why we love it so much. It gives you that extra layer of protection when you're online. It encrypts your personal data so people can't steal it. Websites can't sell it. You can surf from all over the world by jumping servers, which opens your world up to a whole bunch of new content. It can totally change your online experience. Give Surfshark a try, nothing to lose, because it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Download it by going to the link, use the code REGRET, and you'll get 83% off plus three extra months of service. Well, I hope these tips serve you well. Have fun with Halloween this year, folks, and be sure to enjoy this review of Hell Comes to Frogtown. Hey, Big Hoss, I'm here. How's your old friend the Mauve doing? Bill Watts, you son of a bitch. I'm coming for you, cowboy! Yeah! Is there such a thing as cinematic whiplash? Because I'm definitely feeling that this week. The last time we saw Rowdy Roddy Piper on this channel, we were singing his praises left and right for his part in the John Carpenter film, They Live. But going from that to Hell Comes to Frogtown, I feel like I need a neck brace. When it came to leading roles in 1988, it'll be hard to top what Piper accomplished. He may have ended the year with They Live that November, but the year began much differently when Frogtown came out that January. This is a B-movie to rival all B-movies. Set in the post-apocalyptic world, Piper plays a homeless drifter Hmm, where'd I hear that recently? Who happens to be one of the last fertile men on Earth and is ordered by the government to impregnate fertile women in order to help repopulate. But along the way, he's got to survive a deadly group of giant mutated frogs who want the ladies for themselves. You know, typical post-apocalyptic movie fare. Frogtown was distributed by New World Pictures, which put out the original Hellraiser the previous year. Oh boy, when did we get the remake of this on Hulu? The film was written and co-directed by Donald G. Jackson, who directed the the wrestling mockumentary I Like to Hurt People, and also a lot of movies about rollerblading gangs. Hell Comes to Frogtown begat a pair of sequels that came out in the 1990s. Piper refused to appear in those films, which says a lot considering how often his work went into the doing it for the SAG insurance territory. So how does this film rank among such luminaries as Body Slam, The Masked Saint, and Pro Wrestlers vs. Zombies? Well, strap on your government-issued codpiece and your poofy harem slippers, we're about to find out. The film's writing unfortunately peaks in its very first line, but man, what an opener. In the latter days of the 20th century, there arose a difference of opinion. Nuclear war has turned the world into a wasteland. Most of the male population was killed off, and much of the remaining human race went sterile from radiation. Now there's a race to repopulate between the humans and the mutants who have been cast off from what's left of society. A pretty clever gag involving the Statue of Liberty leads to a confrontation between two scavengers, a mutant and a human, whose names are Squid Lips and the Poor Doofus, respectively. Now those are a couple of names I'd love to have on my resume. <laughs> Ooh, ominous. I gotta say, I freaking love these stylized opening credits. It makes it feel less like 1988 and more like 78. We then cut to a dark, empty, cavernous room because who needs sets? Roddy Piper plays Sam Hell, who's been apprehended for being somewhat of a wanderer, hooking up with ladies from town to town. He roams around, around, around. Oh, sorry, I was slipping into the oldie station for a second there. But uh, based on the dialogue, it doesn't sound like Hell's dalliances are exactly playful or carefree. The prisoner was accused of sexual assault. Once she found out she was pregnant, she must have had a change of heart. And he preys on young women. Oh. We know his record. Lie with my daughter. <laughs> hmm, sounds kinda rapey. Yeah? He roams around, 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 around. Some people think women have run into many things. 
Ah, good to see that idiots get to survive the fall of humanity. Hell is taken in by MedTech, a government agency dedicated to repopulating the human race. They discover that Sam has caused several pregnancies in his wake, and while that would be considered incredibly distressing and irresponsible in today's society, here it's all good. You have the highest spermatozoan count we've ever tested. Must have been all that fiber I ate when I was a kid. Okay, that is an amazing line. Since Sam is packing a loaded weapon, MedTech has decided to lock it up for safekeeping. It monitors your physiosexual condition. It's for your own protection. I do love when sci-fi movies make up words that sound important. For being so prolifically potent, Sam has offered a clean slate for his vaguely sketchy record in exchange for stooping as many fertile dames as he can find. It's kind of like a reverse Handmaid's Tale, yet it still benefits the man. It's been revealed that a band of mutants killed a military brigade and kidnapped a group of women that was being transported, and now it's up to Sam and MedTech officer Spangle... Spangle? to infiltrate the mutant city of Frogtown and save them in their bitchin' pink ride. As Sam, Spangle, Spangle? And their armed guard Sentinella make their way into hostile mutant territory, Hell can't stop arguing with his captors about his task, making him the least relatable film hero of all time. Are you serious? Well, maybe you'd rather we sent you back to Devlin. On the other hand, I've always been a patriot. We're gonna get him out, and then you're gonna get him pregnant. Well, maybe you ought to try making love to a complete stranger in the middle of a hostile mutant territory. See how you like it. At one point, he even tries to escape until he finds out that his codpiece is armed, controlled by Spangle's earrings. He's been told the equipment is rigged to blow if he doesn't play along. It's kind of a mix of Escape from New York and Rambo 2, only instead of killing people, it's boinking them. Though, now that I think about it, why send such an important asset into hostile territory when you could just, you know harvest the secret ingredient in-house? What, does IVF technology not exist in the apocalypse? Our heroes camp out for the night, apparently unafraid of being discovered by the angry mutants who we've been told are just all over the place. Spangle emerges from her tent in her military-grade Victoria's Secret and tries to seduce Hell, who's hesitant at first, but then super aggressive about it, but apparently it's all a sham to keep him excited. Then moments later, Sentinella just straight up strips nude and goes to work on Hell, until Spangle once again fulfills her obligation as Colonel Cockblocker. What is the vibe with Hell and Spangle here? It's the next day in paradise. The gang enters the mutant reservation, where apparently it's frowned upon to wear your hat. Hell continues to cause headaches for Spangle, which leads to her abandoning him for a minute. Sounds like a good plan to me. Also, who wants to bet that Piper did this to at least one wrestling contract in his lifetime? Let's renegotiate, huh? As day turns to night, they discover a live one, a fertile woman on the loose, and chase after her. Spangle keeps giving directions, but like, surely they can see her in the headlights at this point, yeah? It's moving, it's still moving. Here it is. It? So they capture the feral, fertile girl who is resisting Spangle's line of questioning. Words of assurance do nothing, so Spangle has to drug her by jabbing her with a needle in the butt, of course. You can start now. What are you talking about? Sam is turned off by the fact that there's no romance or foreplay involved in this particular task. Wow, turns out this guy who's been sleeping with every woman he meets before his capture is just a hopeless romantic. Duh. Spangle begins to implement her seduction techniques in order to help rev up Sam, which includes stripping down to her very practical undergarments, leaning this way and that, and slowly moving her arms around. Holy shit, how can Sam not cut diamonds after all that titillation? Sam mounts this filthy, traumatized, and now roofied girl, all while making eye contact with Spangle, who looks to be jealous of the feral woman's situation. What a sequence of shots this is. It turns out all this chick needed was some sexual healing, as the next morning she's somehow all cleaned up and spilling all the details of her escape from Frogtown. Frogtown is back that way. How far? I ran all day and all night. That's a measure of time, not distance, but thank you. They send the newly impregnated girl off to fend for herself in this hostile mutant territory before the donut wagons back on the road. Spangle disguises herself in some DLC to look as though she is Hell's slave as they enter the Frogtown colony. That's right, it's at this point in the movie in which Hell arrives at Frogtown. Oh, that doesn't sound right. Um, Hell shows up at Frogtown. Hell approaches Frogtown. Hell visits Frogtown. You have the highest spermatozoan count we've ever tested. Hell comes to Frogtown. 
Frogtown, aka this abandoned refinery, is completely silent until they go inside the first place they see, a froggy strip club. The movie gets its Moss Eisley moment where you can see all the frog mutants that make up this place. Notice that they're all wearing masks or helmets to disguise the fact that they only had so many frog costumes. But what in the Sam hell are the odds that he encounters his old pal and fellow scavenger Lonnie, aka Looney Tunes? Gotta admit, I'm not sure what the conflict is with the humans and frogs because they seem to exist fairly peacefully here. Looney Tunes puts Sam in contact with Leroy, the club's very well-dressed owner for a purported barter with Spangle. It's here that we learn why the frog people resent the humans so much. Your kind herded us on to these reservations as if we were cattle. <laughs> that's so silly. I mean, imagine frogs being compared to cows. I mean, that's, 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 what a ridiculous visual. Before the trade can be completed, in comes Bull, the town's corrupt chief and the enforcer for the tyrannical Commander Toady. Yes, folks, these names are really clever. Private Barton. Well, yes, Bull. Shut your hole! Bull punches out Sam and kidnaps Spangle for Toady's harem of human women. Later, Sam wakes up and finds he's been aided by their contact on the inside, a dancer named Arabella, who's a downright ringer for a contestant on that weird dating show on Netflix. Considering the delicate nature of the mission and the massive threat looming over them at every turn, it only makes sense for Arabella to want to jump Sam's bones like every other woman in this movie. <laughs> jump. Do me a favor. Anything, Sam. Oh, put this on. But soon Sam's party lights start going off again, and he has to get closer to Spangle in order for the alarm to subside. Spangle meets Toadie for the first time, who's finishing up an illicit weapons deal with some cheap looking character made up of leftover costume pieces. Sam is discovered and apprehended while Arabella and Looney Lonnie look on. Spangle is being prepared for her rape ritual by being dressed up like someone's idea of a space virgin, complete with ceremonial poofy booties, while the other maidens she's trying to rescue dance around her and caress her body with scarves. Also, she may be drugged? What is all this for? What are you doing? As our captors commanded, awakening your body. Meanwhile, Bull packs a chainsaw and wants to skin Hell's ass raw, or at the very least get his ass free from that chastity belt. However, he's unable to see the damage being done to Piper's pecker when one of those sexy scarves sets off Spangle's earrings. I gotta tell you, you are one weird dude. Oh, you think he's being weird now? Wait till you see him at WrestleMania 6. Bull's finally able to cut through the cod piece and get it off of Sam's body. Just when Sam thinks he was tricked into believing the device would explode, well... <laughs> oh wow, finally something in this movie that resembles action. Arabella comes in and frees Sam from his bondage, only to get stabbed by Bull. Sam pulls the weapon out of her body, then kills Bull with it in return. Now quick, put it back in to plug up the hole. Spangle is made to perform the Dance of the Three Snakes for Toadie, and here you can see she's putting those seduction techniques to good use. I wonder if the director told her, just do whatever, we'll add some special effects and some magic in post. Oh, are those the three snakes? Oh my god, that's- Oh god, she- Why? Meanwhile, Lonnie is caught by a frog guard and has to think fast. Well, let me explain. <laughs> Did the flare go through him? As Sentinella gets her cue to make her way into town, Hell barges in on Toadie and Spangle. Then he utters that famous, iconic line, the one that everyone knows. <laughs> Eat left, froggies! <laughs> yeah, buddy, you know it. Classic. Sam and Spangle grab the captive females and try to escape Frogtown. By the way, am I reading too much into the fact that a lot of these frogmen are wearing turbans? Quick, everyone, into the sexy underwear van! The gang makes their escape, though it turns out Looney is dying from a previously undiscovered head wound. Oh, Lonnie, we hardly knew ye. Seriously, we barely knew anything about this guy besides the fact that he was Sam's friend and that he loved flare guns. Something's coming up fast behind us, and it's bad. <laughs> no, no, don't worry. Return to Frogtown isn't going to be here till 1993. Sure enough, Commander Toadie and his goons are in hot pursuit in their weaponized vehicle. DX would call it a tank. Our heroes almost escape when they're cut off at the pass by the weapons dealer from earlier, whose name is apparently Count Sodom. What a wild name for an incredibly underwhelming reveal. Yeah. Oh, that's, um, oh, God, what was his name? Oh, the jerk from earlier. It's on the tip of my tongue. 
Ah, who cares? Let's hear him lay out his whole plan. Ideal arms to the greeners for their uranium. Soon I shall have the only nuclear weapon since the war. And then I'll wipe the slate clean. And then rid this world of those meddling med tech bitches. But one of the ladies helps Sam get his samurai sword out and throw it directly into Devlin's chest, which is honestly one of the best parts of this whole movie. Devlin somehow flees the scene, leaving behind a trail of his seemingly neon blood. After another Star Wars wipe, Hell discovers him, thinks he's dead, Dead, only he isn't until he is. Sam goes back to the donut wagon to find it destroyed and the lady's missing. Sam confronts the Toadmeister, but his rocket launcher doesn't work, which leads to a fist fight like all 80s action movies should. Thankfully, this one does not go six and a half minutes like the one in They Live. There are some very big Kirk fights the lizard in the desert from Star Trek vibes in this final confrontation, which ends with Tony falling to his death. In the very next scene, Sam is all cleaned up as he observes the wreckage, only to find that Spangle and all the ladies are in fact alive and that she is indeed in love with him. The movie ends with Sam getting into the car and realizing that pretty soon he's going to be on the clock and they're going to be on his, well... I guess what they say is true. What's that? A soldier's work is never done. Look, man, do you want to fuck a bunch of ladies or don't you? And that was Hell Comes to Frogtown. And folks, it goes without saying, this movie is not They Live. It's also not Mad Max, it's not Star Wars, it's not Fallout, it's not Bioshock. You can barely call this sexploitation. But it's still fun to watch once. Much like when Sandra Bullock starred in both an Oscar-winning film and a Razzie-winning film the same year, I can't believe that Roddy Piper had this and They Live on his resume in 1988. I guess it speaks to his range as an actor that the two performances are like night and day, yet his charm carries both films, especially Frogtown, as the rest of the cast is barely able to keep up with him. I didn't quite understand Sam's reluctance to sleep with every woman he shares a scene with given his established history, and he and Spangle had absolutely zero chemistry. Hell Comes to Frogtown is a basic, low-budget sci-fi film that uses tropes and I'm guessing some leftover costumes from other New World Pictures productions. A solid concept with not-so-great execution. It feels like a lovely homage to 1970s cinema with somewhat better practical effects. It's cheesy and campy and Piper's charisma really makes it worth a watch, whether or not you're a wrestling fan. But there's an emphasis on a watch. Well, that'll just about do it for this month's look back at Roddy Piper in the movies. Two more down and only, um, oh, oh God, that's, that's, that's a lot. Oh, that's a lot there. Oh, you know what? We can save this for another month down the line. How about it? Next month, we're talking about Survivor Series. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.